So first, the Technical University, I hope you know, it's a university in Munich, one of the biggest technical universities in Munich we have, and uh, Munich is in the southern part, so where the beer is made, so uh, this would be a nice story to tell as well, but I will not talk too much about beer today. Um, so, it's, oh, it's a bit, can we change that? But okay, so, this, the university has about 37,000 students, about 500 professors, and um, it has several campi in Munich and to the north of that. And um, we have actually 13 departments, so like chemistry, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and so forth. But uh, we have something also new, and I think it's a good idea. So we have this integrative research centers. So they are not real departments, but they are some kind of a department where they bundle the expertise in TUM for certain applications, like energy research. And I am a member in this Munich School of Engineering. So here we focus on energy re research, right? So certain topics, and I will explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, so the Munich School of Engineering was founded, I think, 2008, and we have four major research topics we are working on, okay? So first is power generation, where we want to make classical power plants more flexible to allow and achieve the energy, energy you know, changing from fossil fuels to renewables, because you all know that then the grid might be more fragile and so forth. And uh, here we have the renewable energy network. I'm part of this network, of course. And of course, we're looking at electric vehicles. Here you see a vehicle which was developed completely at TUM. And uh, another big issue with energy is, of course, buildings, right? We waste, not waste, but we use a lot of energy in buildings. And so we are thinking here uh, for new ideas uh, for sustainable buildings. So, in the Munich School of Engineering, we have three research groups, junior research group, we call them, and one of them, this is my group. And, uh, yeah, we started in 2014 with two of my PhD students, Christian and Schechner, and in the meantime, we grew a little bit. We got funding from the European Union, from the DFG, which is the German Research Council, and uh, another project on geothermal thermal energy, so we increased this, and I collaborate with industry. Uh, so with a new startup, they are developing a wave converter. I will talk, a lot, bit, talk about this in the future a bit, and uh, a project with BMW, okay? And of course, since I was postdoc at Professor Kennel's place, I also collaborate with other PhDs still from him. Okay, and what are we doing? At the moment, we have six big research projects. The first one is classical wind turbines. So what we want to do, we want to improve efficiency and reliability. I think you know the gearbox is a problem for wind turbines. But if you look at the figures in more detail, and you expand this probability of the failures of each subcomponent, you see that it's not the gearbox which is the most problem. It's electrical systems, the sensors, and control. And control is simply a part of software, right? And so there we thought we might try and help to contribute. The next thing, this is the European project, is airborne wind energy. Maybe you've heard of that which is that there's an airborne flying in the air, right? And you have your generator right at the bottom. And here's the tether connecting this airborne. And of course, if there's wind blowing up there, there will be a force pulling on this tether, right? So you have a way to produce energy when this tether is reeled out. But of course, the tether is not very, very long, so you have to reel back in. This means that there will be a, a cycle where you generate energy and a cycle where you have to reel in, back reel in, and this is a phase where you dissipate power. So you have some kind of a pumping mode, okay? 
The advantage is, of course, that this guy here is lightweight, not heavy. You only have this tether. You don't have to have a, power, a, a tower here. So it should be cheaper. This is at least the idea. And most important, you in, can exploit the high winds, the strong winds in higher altitudes. Okay? So the ideas are to go up to, I don't know, 500, 1,000 meters. Good. Another project is, which I will talk in more detail later on, is the small scale wind turbines. And here we want to use, sorry for the quality here, is that the generator here should be re replaced by a very cheap and robust technology, which is a reluctant synchronous machine. Okay? It's a nicely nonlinear machine, so that's bad, but I like it. I do controls. Nonlinear systems are fun. So I will talk about this later. And this is the cooperation with the um, company. They want to produce energy from waves. So the waves pass by, and so these balls are swimming on the water and will move up and down, right? So you will also have something like a pumping cycle for energy generation where these balloons swim upwards. But to make the whole platform balanced, you need to push them back again, right? So yeah, there might be a phase where you dissipate energy as well. And here we are looking on the electrical system. Then we have geothermal power systems where we look on the fault tolerant control of the pump. The pump is very important. You have to pump up the hot liquids. And the last project is uh, yeah, with BMW on optimal control of the drive train. Hmm? Good. What did we do this far? The group was funded in 2014, so we did not know too much about this renewable energy systems, but this is our point of view. Huh? So, for example, wind turbines, we saw that we have a wind turbine, the aerodynamic torque is our input. We don't know much about aerodynamics or structural loads, so we make it simple. But then we start modeling the whole system, so we focus on the electrical system, right? And uh, since 2014, so we tried to catch up and published some results all over the place. So I could say we somehow do understand the system a little bit. But of course, there's still a lot to learn. Okay? And what I will focus now today on is this reluctant synchronous generator. So we want to replace the classical doubly fit machine or the permanent magnet machine by a reluctant synchronous machine, which is very robust, cheap for example, because you don't need permanent magnets, huh? so no rare earth, and it's easy to produce. Okay, and so I would like to introduce this project in more detail, so now the technical stuff starts. It's maybe more fun, I hope. Motivation. Maybe you see it now better, so you have here a small-scale wind turbine. This is about 20 meters. You have here a small generator, and we want to replace this with a robust um, reluctant synchronous machine. So this is in Stellenbosch in South Africa, a collaboration we have. They design this reluctant synchronous machine, and we do the control. Okay? <clears throat> Why should reluctant synchronous machines be interesting? Yeah, because in the rotor you don't have copper anymore, right? So you simply have a specially designed rotor, which consists, for example, uh, of punched iron sheets. And um, so you have not copper losses anymore in the rotor. So you can increase um, the efficiency compared to classical induction machines, right? Permanent magnet machines is a different story. You also don't have copper in the rotor. But compared to that, it's interesting. And compared to classical permanent magnet machines, you achieve close efficiencies as well. So. Disadvantages might be power factor because here you also have to induce some field. The nice thing, to me is at least, it's highly nonlinear. So classical controls will not work properly. You have to think a bit more. And you have to use an inverter, but in this classical wind turbines, you have inverters, right? So it's no problem. And the, yeah, the comp control gets a bit more complicated, but let's talk about this. So what did you do before? Yes, we modeled all the system, right? So we had started with a permanent magnet machine, no gear, that's simple. And now we simply re replace this, right? Because you don't have to go to this high pole per numbers here, so probably you need to have a simple gear. Huh? What do you have to do from the control perspective now? 
you have to change the current controller here and probably do something for in a related to efficiency, like maximum torque per ampere, right? Because you cannot control this machine only with a Q current. You need also a D current, okay? So this is what we had to change in our whole setup. And uh, let's look at the model of these reluctant synchronous machines. That's the model. Probably you see that. That's in the direct budget uh, co coordinate system. And uh, the bad thing is that these flux maps here, the flux here, the flux linkage maps, you see they depend on the currents. So this is here now an example for low power machine. But it, you see it's nonlinear, right? In D and Q axis. And it's covered. So you have a highly nonlinear system. Okay? Because these currents here, you want to control the currents first, somehow change the behavior of the system. The good thing is, if you have these maps, you can use some kind of a nonlinear adaptive controller, which I will explain in some minutes. But if you don't have this flux maps, how do you start to control this machine? You could, you, because you want to extract this flux maps, okay? Because with those, you can do maximum torque per ampere, for example, to improve efficiency. So for that, I want to present something. We got the measurements result very recent, only the week before I flew to Chile, so it's not published that, but you're going to see it first. I hope you like it. So these are actually the inductances. Huh? So they change all over the place. You can you assume that they are constants, what you often do when you do drive control. So I want to talk about current PI funnel control for these machines. Funnel, funnel is something you use to fill water into a bottle, for example. So I want to, you know, narrow down the error with this funnel. And this is the idea, okay? What is it? So I, the problem now is I don't know the machine at all, but I want to do current tracking, okay? Current control for a given reference. And the idea is now, so the red thing here, this capital lambda, is my funnel boundary, okay? And I want to fill in my tracking error here. It starts somewhere, and I want that it remains in the red region. It should stay in this funnel for all time, without knowing the machine, okay? Now, you, control system, uh, control theory comes in a little bit. You can analyze your system, your nonlinear system, concerning some structural properties like relative degree and so forth, not too important. But if you do so, you can see, oh, this system has a certain property. And you can control it with a very simple controller. So this is actually the voltage in DQ I would apply to the machine, right? So I, this will be transformed by Clark and Park, sorry, Park and Clark to your inverter to apply voltages. And uh, this, so you have a proportional controller, right? E is simply the, uh, I think I have it here, yeah, oops, sorry. It's simply the difference between the errors, right, in D and Q, so this is vectors. And you multiply this error with some gain K, kappa, kappa. And this gain kappa changes over time. So I adapt it instantaneously. Okay, and how do I adapt it? Because my goal is that this E, so the norm of the error, so simply this guy, the magnitude of this error, is within this red region, okay? This is what I want to achieve. And the controller works like this. Here you see kappa. So you have one over this lambda minus the magnitude of the error. So this means I always subtract this value from that. So if we are very close here, this represents the difference, right, between the boundary and my actual current magnitude. So if we are close, this is bad, right, because we are close to leave this nice funnel where we can pre-specify where we are. So if this is small, this gain gets large. And with that large gain, we push back the error. Okay, this is the idea. So, and if we are far away from this red line, this boundary here, for example here, you see that the distance between these two guys is larger. So we can reduce the gain again. 
Okay? So we only increase the gain when it's necessary. When not, we decrease it. Okay? So very simple. I, these kind of systems have something we call intrinsic high gain property. So high gains might help. But we all know high gains are not good, at least not at any instant of time. So only here we use high gains when necessary, which means we are close to this boundary, capital lambda. And capital lambda is our tuning parameter now. So forget about KP and KI from a PI controller. Now you have a function over time. Okay? And this is a function you de design. And in my case, I often use simply an exponentially decaying function. We all, all want that our transients will behave like this, right? So I simply choose an exponentially de decaying function. So this is our controller, but we also know that if this is a proportional controller, you will not achieve steady state accuracy. What we need is this integral control action. That's why I include now a PI controller, okay? In series to that controller. So a PI controller simply uh, yeah, drawn here in a block diagram. So here sits our adaptive funnel controller. Here we have, yeah, maybe again, you can set this to one, doesn't matter. And here you have this integral control action, right? But we know that this, the four voltages in our inverter are constrained. So we have wind-up problems. So we need to use maybe conditional integration, which means if this reference voltage here is too large, we simply stop integration here, right? And if you analyze this PI controller with anti-wind-up, you can say, okay, uh, this, this guy here acts as a disturbance, and then the theory of funnel control tells you, oh, tells you if you have a bounded input disturbance, you can still apply funnel control. Doesn't matter. And yeah, we know this integral control action helps to achieve steady state accuracy. Hmm? So what did we do? Implementation, so these are new. Yeah? So they're not perfect, simply rough, rough first results, but they work. And this is what I want to share with you. This is our setup. Here it's a reluctant synchronous machine, torque sensor, not important at the moment, and permanent magnet machine. And uh, classical thing we did, this is reality. We do parky clock transformation and backwards, and here we implemented this panel FPI funnel controller. So we measure the currents, and we give some reference currents, okay? And how do, do these measurements look like? Like this. It's pretty small. I try to explain. So here we see the error norm. So this is the magnitude of the error, the tracking error. The red thing is the boundary. This is our tuning parameter. And the blue one is the error. And you see, okay, we stay always below this red line. And you, here you see kappa, this gain, of course, if we are closer to the boundary, the gain increases. So then it goes down again, increases, and so forth, right? And maybe this is the most important part. Here you see the D and the Q currents. Red dashed, you see the reference. Okay? Here as well. And blue, you see the actual system response. And you see they track, okay. Not perfect, but you do, we don't know the system yet, okay? But it's okay. For a first step, it works. And here you see the, um, the speed of the machine, and here the use of the voltage. Here is always the changing dc link voltage, and we exploit it as, po as much as possible. Good, so this works, but we don't know the machine, so we don't know the flux maps. With that approach, we could not do efficient control of the machine in the sense of a renewable energy system. But with that, you could extract in the, your lab your flux maps, okay? You simply can... Yeah, insert certain currents, make a certain speed, and then you can compute your flux maps. It's going to be a lookup table then, okay? And now we obtain these flux maps and do a more interesting controller for the future. And now it's going to be model-based. Now we assume we know our model, okay? Ah, this is simply the zoom. Here you see if we're close, high gains, we are still going back to zero. Here we have a jump in the reference, so we go here, we increase the funnel go back. We, we stay inside, so simply assume. And now we do a nonlinear PI controller for this nonlinear system, but now we assume we know it. Okay? How do we do that? This is the normal thing, or one approach you could do. You approximate your 
stated dynamics by this first order lag system, you have this drop coupling terms there, you have this inverter there, an approximation as first order system, and you have simply this PI controller where you have to tune these two parameters, right? And you do this compensation to try to compensate these coupling terms. Classical approach. And tuning rules, so normally this time constants of the state depend on these inductances. And the dead time is proportional to the switching frequency, and we assume now this, this, uh, this cross-coupling we can compensate for in an ideal way. And then you could, for example, use the tuning rule magnitude optimum. You can look up in um, textbooks any other tuning rule, but we have an analytical solution for or yeah, analytical way to derive these gains, the proportional gain of the PI controller, and for this time constant, okay? And this is the idea. We want to use this tuning rule also for the nonlinear system. And the idea is very simple. So this was the assumption of linear system, and now it's simply nonlinear, which means that this is changing, and so of course we have to change our tuner, controller tuning, okay? And we do this online. So what means that well, the only thing actually which is changing is this time constant of your stator. Yeah? It now depends on these inductances. I've shown before this rough hills and so. And you have to track them now depending on your currents. For that you need the lookup tables, no problem. And then you simply do this. You tune these two parameters accordingly, okay? The nice thing with that is the idea with magnitude optimum is that you can approximate the whole current control loop with a very simple first order lag system, which implies that the outer cascade for speed control, you can tune for one very simplified dynamical system. And if you do this, this adaption, it will be the same dynamical system. So the outer cascade, you can use your classical controller design as well. Measurement results here for, so this is very noisy because they want to show you the real thing. This is what we get, no uh, yeah, filtering. D, Q axis, this is the reference torque with which we then computed the reference currents, and this is the speed here at the certain fixed speed. You see we have here the steps, and yes, seemingly we can track that. But zoom in, and we see, okay, here's the reference. We track it nicely, here we track it, and it's always this first order lag system I said. The overall current dynamics will be a first order lag system, and this for all speeds, for all currents. Good. So now, if you know your machine better, you can do better control. Okay? And now we go to the step where we need to improve efficiency, because we all know this is actually, for this machine, the torque map. And if you, yeah put a plane into that, you know here, for example, would have different currents to produce the same torque, right? And of course, you want to choose the torque vector with the smallest magnitude. And then you can simply yeah, use a numerical method here in this way to compute the uh, reference current. So yeah, the input is a reference torque. You use maximum torque per ampere numerically to compute this reference currents to minimize the copper losses and uh, yeah, you obtain something like this, either in polar coordinates or in DQ, doesn't matter, and then you use these reference currents to track with your controller we designed, okay? Since we don't like this numerical approach, at the moment we are working on an analytical method for maximum torque per ampere, but this is not finished yet, but we are close, so I could not present this now. Overall simulation of the wind turbine system now with reluctant synchronous machine, so here you see what we changed. The rest is standard. And um, yeah, it's more or less working. Here is the wind speed. It depends on the wind speed. Uh, the, the power, wind power, it depends on this cubed of the wind speed. So this is a bit more. And here you see uh, in Suyuan the mechanical power. And here the power induced to the grid, power on the point of common coupling. You see it works. You can, of course, do reactive power control. And uh, in this case, we did this maximum power point tracking for wind speeds less than nominal wind speed. And you see it's working as well, so we are close to this optimal speed here. And here you see the torque we generate. So it's also very close to the reference. So this works, and with that I come to my conclusion. 
In my opinion, control is essential, like power electronics, of course, but control is also Im important. And uh, for me, I like nonlinear control, and for that, you need state space analyzers. So frequency domain transfer functions are not useful here. And uh, if you do it correctly, you can improve efficiency, right? Um, you can guarantee optimal operation. And uh, this is the other goal. We want to, to make it more reliable, as I said in the beginning. You can improve and protect your system. And future challenges, I would say, are, of course, yeah, economically feasible change. Let's see. This is, I think, the main task we have to do, right? We make it affordable for us. And uh, main goal here is also that we can increase reliability and increase fault tolerance. As I said, controls, that is a very, that was a big su surprise to me, and the electric subsystems are fault prone in wind turbine systems. As far as I know, it's not really understood why this happens, but that's the case, okay? And of course, the weak will get more uh, weaker and weaker, so we meet need to be more flexible. And there, as we've seen today, a lot more interesting topologies are out there. So sorry for not talking about MPC here. It was something different, but I hope it was interesting. I'm happy to get some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.